Midway through the volume entitled Swan's Way, at a society soiree, Charles Swan hears the sonata containing the little musical phrase that has come to represent his tortured love affair with Odette de Crécy. The sonata is by a little known composer by the name of Van Toy. Toward the end of an eight page description of this music, we read this. Swan did not dare to move and would have made all the other people be still too, as if the slightest motion might compromise the fragile, exquisite, and supernatural magic that was so close to vanishing. No one, in fact, dreamed of speaking. The ineffable word of one man who was absent, perhaps dead, Swan did not know if Fantoy was still alive. Breathing out above the rights of these officiants was enough to hold the attention of 300 people and made of this dais where a soul had thus been summoned, one of the noblest altars on which a supernatural ceremony could be performed. So that when the phrase came unraveled at last, floating in shreds in the motifs which followed and had already taken place, if at first Swann was irritated to see the Comtesse de Monterriandere, famous for her naive remarks, lean toward him to confide her impressions even before the sonata had ended, he could not help smiling and perhaps also found a deeper meaning that she did not see in the words she used. Awestruck by the virtuosity of the performers, the Comtesse exclaimed to Swan, it's amazing. I've never seen anything so powerful. But a scruple for accuracy, causing her to correct her first assertion, she added this reservation, anything so powerful since the table turning. Table turning is a reference to 19th century seances, events like our own or like the use of a Ouija board, whereby messages are brought to us from another realm. As Swan recognizes, the reference is uncannily appropriate to his own way of thinking about Van Toy's sonata. To hear the sonata is to be visited by something from another realm. Something essential must travel a difficult and distant way in order to appear, but only to appear shrouded in mystery and yet recognizable to almost anyone when it appears in its obscured form. Art is like this throughout In Search of Lost Time, and there is much art to be considered. The narrator explores music, painting, literature, acting and drama, architecture, and even fashion and cuisine in his pursuit of the meaning of art. All art, he learns, is the appearance of something from another world. All art is the turning of the table, leaving us to decipher the meaning of what has appeared to discover the reality rising to the surface, to find its resonance in us. From the start, I will share some distinctions we should keep in mind. Charles Swan is not the narrator of the novel. He is a character about whom our first person narrator relates a long, almost 200 page story. It is Swan who hears the sonata in the passage we opened with but I will suggest that Swan's thinking represents a development in our narrator's aesthetic perspective. In Search of Lost Time is written entirely from the perspective of this single first person narrator, a man who has, at times, nearly omniscient access to the other characters we encounter along the way. The narrator appears at different ages through the novel, beginning as an older man remembering his earlier life and then assuming the perspective of that younger self, whom we follow roughly chronologically from childhood to middle age. We never truly leave that older narrator who opens the novel, but there is a complex web of times and narrative voices that leave us frequently disoriented. In other words, expect to be confused tonight. I'm hoping this introduction is the only confusing part. A few program notes for tonight's lecture. The word for the organ of sight, an E-Y-E, -E, 
is never used in this lecture. Anytime you hear me say I, you're hearing a use of the first person pronoun. Two, I have not provided you with a handout for the lecture, and yet I will quote extensively and at length. I will try to be clear when I'm quoting, and for those of you who wish to read some of the passages I refer to, I do have a handout that will be available after the lecture in the question period. Three, I aim to be punctilious about whether I am referring to Marcel Proust or to the narrator of the book, either or both of whom could be considered to be the author of the text we are reading. Four, I will refer to the whole of In Search of Lost Time as a book, a novel, or a work, whereas the differently titled volumes that appear in publication are volumes, each also containing multiple parts. I primarily draw from the first volume, Swan's Way, and three of its four parts. Those parts in order are Combray One, Combray Two, and Swan in Love. The lecture does not limit itself entirely to volume one, but explores other volumes without, I hope, giving any spoilers for those of you who still have the pleasures of reading In Search of Lost Time ahead of you. In fact, my senior language class told me they would leave the lecture if there were spoilers, so <laughs> be careful. This lecture is motivated by a persistent question I have. It concerns the I. What is an author doing when he or she creates an I within a work of fiction? The fictionalized I turns out to be thematic among many treasured program authors. In one of the earliest instantiations of the modern novel, Cervantes inserts an author into his novel and then cautions us against complacency in this knowledge. He, the I who published the book, is not, in fact, the author. He is instead the finder of a manuscript by Cide Hamede Benengeli. Another humorist of sorts, Kierkegaard, famously chooses pseudonyms and multiple eyes to be the authors and first-person voices of his books. We might consider Augustine, Dante, Eliot. I'm sure you can think of others, and I invite you to raise them later. Of all of these, Proust's eye, who appears in many different voices and times within In Search of Lost Time, might be the most artistically and prolongedly crafted, and also, perhaps, the hardest to keep separate from the author himself. So for tonight, my motivating question is limited to Proust, and in fact, we'll only get touched on at the very end of the lecture, as there is too much preliminary ground to explore. In its transformed version, the question for, night, for tonight takes the following forms. In his novel, largely devoted to exploring both art and reality, why does Proust offer a fictionalized I as the hero, narrator, and subject? What is the relationship of art to self that Proust both explores and deploys in In Search of Lost Time. In order to address the question of what Proust is up to here, we will look at the way the narrator comes to understand art, specifically literature and music, before trying to comprehend how the ultimate author of In Search of Lost Time brings that theory into practice. The lecture has four parts. In the first part, we will turn to our narrator's early experiences as a reader. Next, we will look at Swan's experience of music before we turn back in the following part to our narrator and begin to see what he does as a writer himself. Finally, briefly, in whatever time we have left, I will attempt to understand how our narrator's theory becomes our author's project and why the self might be the best or only possible subject for this novel. So in the next 45 to 50 minutes, I will attempt to answer these three tiny questions. What is art? What is the self? And how are they connected? Part one, the narrator of fiction. One rather simple and of course inadequate way of summarizing In Search of Lost Time is to view it as the narrator's path to becoming the author of the fictional work we are reading. That is, within the book, the plot could be described as the trajectory of a young boy growing up to be an author, to become an author, who, within the world of this book, later writes the very book we are reading. Let us begin by meeting this young boy. Two problems persistently plague our sensitive and asthmatic narrator 
beginning from the earliest of the ages at which we meet him. Can he become a writer? And if so, what will be the subject of his writing? To investigate, we will begin, as our narrator does, with reading and with what happens to him when he reads. In Search of Lost Time opens with an older narrator who reminds us of a time earlier in his life when he used to go to bed early. The version of the narrator who used to go to bed at reasonable hours would often fall asleep reading and would then find himself in a partial dream world where he becomes the subject of the book he was reading. Quote, it seemed to me that I myself was what the book was talking about, a church, a quartet, the rivalry between, between Francois I and Charles V, end quote. Already in the second sentence of our novel, the author has introduced the notion that I can become the subject of a novel, albeit here in a dream state. We read on, however, and we go back in time with our narrator to find him as a boy, reading in the garden in his family's summer home in Cambrai, forced outside by a grandmother who believes that fresh air can cure everything. This boy can read for hours on end, and for him, reading is such an engaging activity that it alters his very experience of the space and time around him. We now find him devouring the works of Bergot, an author recommended to him by a friend. This author, Bergot, is the first fictional artist of In Search of Lost Time. Up until now, we have had references to paintings and to books, but they have been real works, works by authors you would find on the shelves of Greenfield Library, reliefs you would find in Padua, Italy. Of the music that flows through In Search of Lost Time, only the composer who wrote our opening sonata is fictional, and we don't actually encounter his work until later in the book. Proustian scholars and first-time readers alike love to speculate about the fictional artists of the narrator's world. There are entire books devoted to such speculation. I take a very different position on it. I will only suggest for now that the creation of fictional artists who inhabit places among painters, poets, and authors we all know of allows Proust to demonstrate a principle fundamental to his own thinking about art. To know the artist is not to have privileged insight into the art itself. This caveat is often ignored by the aforementioned Proust scholars. As we turn to our narrator, ruminating over his own pleasures in reading, one of the first elements of reading he points out is that in order to cultivate a particular emotion in the reader, quote, abolishing real people is a decisive improvement, end quote. Real people are impenetrable to us, while novelists create people out of what he says are, quote, immaterial parts, parts which our soul can assimilate, end quote. The work of the novelist is to create emotions and experiences in the reader, to implicate the reader by offering actions and states we can make our own, all the easier when we need not pry them out of the material, sensible stuff we encounter in real people. A fictional character is not more true to us, but might feel more real to us because the feelings can become our own. The narrator has become obsessed with Bergot, comparing the experience of reading his work to that of listening to music. Quote, then I noticed the rare, almost archaic expressions he liked to use at certain moments. When a hidden wave of harmony, an inner prelude would heighten his style. End quote. Here we find a musical analogy used in an attempt to articulate what is literary. This mixing of the language with which he describes each art continues throughout the book. Style, which strikes our young reader first, is an important element of art, one that the older narrator will call, quote, a question of vision, end quote. Next, however, the narrator comes to realize that repetition and memory add to the pleasure of reading Bergat. And I'm quoting here. One of these passages from Bergat 
the third or fourth that I had isolated from the rest, filled me with a joy that could not be compared to the joy I had discovered in the first one. What had happened was that, recognizing the same taste for rare expressions, the same musical effusion, the same idealist philosophy that had already at the other times, without my realizing it, been the source of my pleasure, I no longer had the impression I was in the presence of a particular passage from a certain book by Bergot, but rather of the ideal passage by Bergot, common to all his books, to which all the analogous passages that had merged with it had added a sort of thickness, a sort of volume, by which my mind seemed enlarged. The words by Bergot, the images produced, are pleasurable, but the real pleasure the joy that could not be compared to the earlier ones comes from the recognition of repetition. The repetition is not of words here, but of a kind of style. And the experience of the reader is profoundly enhanced by the way that repetition adds depth to the original. The reader himself is profoundly affected by the repetition, which produces an experience in him of finding the same again. What he, here calls he, what he here calls the ideal passage by Bergot is no specific passage, but any passage of a certain sort that emerges from the others because it is happening not for the first time. The experience of reading is enhanced and augmented as particular elements become thematic, as memory gets to work, identifying what is like in kind so that we might enjoy the way the prior is coming to reappear in the present. As much as he loves reading, our narrator suffers early setbacks in his desire to be a writer. Absorbing the poetry and novels of his time convinces our young narrator that he has, quote, no hope of ever being a famous writer, end quote. Along with reading, many of the memories recounted from his time in Cambrai take place on walks in and around the town. As a boy who walks with his family and then as a young man who walks on his own, the narrator experiences moments of sheer sensuality on these walks, often engaging in a heady description of natural phenomena, hawthorn bushes, bad weather, that contorts itself into a quasi-sexual longing. The sudden pleasures stumbled upon while walking from, quote, a roof, a glimmer of sun on a stone, the smell of the road, end quote, seem to conceal something from him. They beckon to him as things that are, quote, so full, so ready to open, to yield for me the thing which they themselves were merely a cover. It is no wonder our youthful and adolescent narrator confounds these moments with love or sexual desire. In these experiences, he encounters something that calls to him with a siren song, and with any light, luck might yield itself to him. Our narrator laments his inability to focus on these encountered pleasures, aware of the mental laziness that leads him to avoid what he calls, quote, the arduous task imposed on his consciousness of trying to perceive what was concealed behind them, end quote. Confusing the smell of hawthorns with love for a little girl, or the pink reflection of a tile roof with the desire for a peasant girl to appear in front of him, the boy both acknowledges his laziness and allows the restless seeking for the reality behind phenomena to find an easy analog in sensual desire. Since the pleasure in question comes to him through his body, a rush of delight from color or scent, he unknowingly substitutes bodily possession for the pursuit of what is hidden behind these appearances. At the same time, in these things which distract him with their fecundity, he finds respite from the tedium and impotence he experiences when he looks for, quote, a philosophical subject for a great literary work, end quote. At one point, he refers to a possible disease of the brain or the black hole that opened in my mind when I looked for the subject of my writing. Though the narrator experiences great pleasure both in reading and along his walks, it appears that he holds the latter pleasures to be unworthy of artistic expression. He believes that reading yields intellectual pleasures, while walks produce only bodily pleasures. 
The child narrator does not think that probing the impressions from his walks, even if he were energetic enough to do so, would be a sufficiently intellectual project to be the subject of writing. Yes, there are moments in life where objects seem to call out to us to offer a particular joy related to something they hide. And yes, certain works of art, books in particular, seem to do something similar. But these two things don't seem to be connected for our young narrator. Life and art remain different. Part two, Swan in Love with Music. Recall that the passage with which I open this lecture is not, at least not explicitly, the narrator's thinking, but that of Charles Swan. Swan is the starting point of a thinking of music, a leitmotif in its own right, that runs through in search of lost time. One which perhaps culminates when our narrator, in a reconfigured repetition of Swan's experience, hears a septet by the same composer at a society soiree in volume five. Thus, we begin with a sonata and Swan, but crescendo with the septet and our narrator, following which the music of Van Toy fades out as the novel more directly moves on to its final literary exploration. It is likely, however, that of all the artistic forms explored in In Search of Lost Time, music is the closest to literature. The question of why we hear the music first with Swan serves as a lens through which we explore our larger questions of art and creativity that our narrator in volume five finds himself in a position very similar to that of Swan in volume one, further complicates our underlying question about the fictionalized I. Might Swan be an incipient version of the narrator? Might an I dispersed? Might an I be dispersed into different characters through the book, further undermining the cohesion of self? For now, we have to set those questions aside, and so I begin by proposing that our time with Swan is a sort of first sailing on which the artistic theory developed through In Search of Lost Time sets out. The rocks on which this initial sailing falters are the flaws and failings that prevent Swan from becoming an artist or even a productive art critic. So let's think a little about Swan, about what we know of him, in order to see why his understanding of art though not entirely erroneous, is severely limited. Our time with Swan, in the section Swan in Love, is the part of the novel where our narrator fades most prolongedly into the background. It is really a short novella about Swan. Swan plays many roles in In Search of Lost Time. He is a friend primarily of the narrator's parents and grandfather, who were friends and neighbors in Cambrai. Later, Swan will become the father of the narrator's obsessive crush, then eventually a social acquaintance and ultimately a legitimate friend to the narrator. Importantly, for a very young iteration of our narrator, Swan is the unknowing cause of many nights of suffering. On the nights when Swan visits the family in Cambrai, the child narrator must go to bed without his nightly viaticum, the goodnight kiss from his mother. The entire first part of the novel is the narrator's memory of these nights, including one night in particular that the older narrator will refer back to as, quote, the loveliest and saddest night of my life, end quote. The narrator's accessible memories of Cambrai are all unhappy ones, and they pertain to Swan. Perhaps in an artistic feat of retribution, against the man he calls the unconscious author of my sufferings, at the end of Cambrai II, an older version of the narrator tells us that he will now relate a story about Swan that he, our narrator, learned in part from his grandfather and in part through later conversations with Swan. It is in this section of the book, Swan in Love, the section that occupies the greatest part of Swan's way that our opening musical passage occurs. Swan actually hears the Van Toy sonata performed multiple times. We will focus on a few of these and on the ways in which Swan fails on each of these occasions. One of the hearings, Swan's last within this volume, is the one we opened with, which takes place towards the end of Swan's sad love story with Odette. 
Another takes place before the story of Swan in Love and occurs, so to speak, off stage. Swan's first hearing of the sonata sets the foundation for the next, the one that we, as reader, are witness to. We learn of the first hearing when Swan hears the piece for the second time, when he joins Odette for a dinner party at the home of Monsieur and Madame Verderin. Hearing the sonata at the Verderin Salon, Swan recalls that first hearing, and we learn, through an extended memory on his part, how momentous it had been for him. When he first heard that music, Swan had experienced a striking kind of pleasure, a pleasure he owed perhaps to his self-proclaimed ignorance of music. Not being able to formulate rational notions about music, he experienced it as follows, and I quote, an impression that is purely musical, immaterial, entirely original, an impression sine materia. No doubt, the notes we hear then tend already, depending on their loudness and their quantity, to spread out before our eyes over, ver over surfaces of varying dimensions, to trace arabesques, to give us sensations of breath, tenuousness, stability, whimsy. But the notes vanish before these sensations are sufficiently formed in us not to be submerged by those already excited by the succeeding or even simultaneous notes. And this impression would continue to envelop with its liquidity, its mellowness, the motifs that at times emerge from it, barely discernible, immediately to dive under and disappear, known only by the particular pleasure they give, impossible to describe, to recall, to name, ineffable. If memory, like a laborer working to put down lasting foundations in the midst of waves, by fabricating for us facsimiles of these fleeting phrases, did not allow us to compare them to those that follow and to differentiate them. When the same impression suddenly returned, it was no longer impossible to grasp. It's the end of the passage. Let us note some elements of Swan's experience here. The musical notes are without material, yet they are highly mobile and in all kinds of ways. They spread out, they trace arabesques, they vanish, dive. The notes inhabit space, dance, swim, hide. At first, the notes seem subject to a linear temporal order. They are either successive or simultaneous. But then, when memory steps in, the notes escape the linear description of time to become subjected to a layered notion of time. Musical phrases become the ground, and memory makes facsimiles, images, of these phrases, and begins to compare and differentiate among those images. The images allow us to identify what is the same in the midst of all the flux, as the past reveals itself again in the present. The rush of pleasure Swan experienced when first hearing the Van Toy Sonata is already a first step in artistry. Our narrator has experienced this pleasure, or one very much like it, twice already in prior pages of the book. Such a pleasure is unexpected, unaccountable, and untraceable. It can be neither named nor thought. The cause of the pleasure is something that has traveled from a distance to appear transfigured, mobile, in the present. The passage that opens this lecture, Swan's third hearing of the sonata, compares the music to a divinity. Here, in Swan's first hearing, the music is like a painter's brush or a dancer. It is then a liquid, perhaps the ocean, or something carried in the ocean. The analogies are fundamental to the production of art. These images do not merely help the reader produce her own image, they produce a musical experience in the reader. The thing attempting to be expressed, the music, or better, some essential element of the music, appears moving through the analogies just as it moves through the sentence which describes them, as something that reappears and recurs in differentiated form, appealing to our own sensibility and responsiveness. Each new analogy is at once 
a repetition and a differentiation. The multiple images expressing the one thing we cannot hear in the book, the music, produce the thickness, the volume that allow it to enter us, such that even though we do not hear music, we nonetheless have a musical experience. Like Swan, we too become temporarily captured by the memory of that first hearing. Our own introduction to the piece of music is immediately layered by Swan's past experience of it. But we are not at that party a year ago. We are Chez Verdurin, where Odette and Swan are courting. And a year has intervened since Swan first heard the piece that prepared to open in him the possibility of a sort of rejuvenation. What has happened in the intervening year? Has Swan become youthful again? Did his first encounter with the Sonata, finding himself, quote, in the presence of one of those invisible realities in which he had ceased to believe, end quote, allow him to devote himself to art, to creation, to learning music? The short answer, of course, is no. After a few failed attempts to find out who was the composer or the musician who had played it, Swan stopped thinking about it altogether. There are two related reasons why Swan fails here, why the music does not sufficiently inspire him to create or pursue art. The first is a lifelong habit of laziness, of thinking easy thoughts. The second is that Swan confounds the sensual pleasure he experiences in art with the sexual pleasure he experiences with women. The sonata morphs into Odette. Swan's passion for her is aroused by repetition and culminates on an evening when he searches the streets for her in despair of finding her. His love for her is fundamentally a desire to possess her, to learn her, to understand her. In a later episode, Swan can't stop kissing Odette as she tries to play the sonata for him on the piano. She finally demands of him, now decide what you want. Should I play the piano or play with you? On the surface, it appears that Swan cannot choose between Odette and the Sonata. In reality, he has already chosen. The accessible, habitual, comfortable, comfortable pleasures of being with a woman substitute for the demanding, difficult, and disruptive pleasures of art. Swan fails in love as he fails in art. A passion for possession is a passion for complete understanding. Ultimately, it is an intellectual, not artistic passion. Artistic passion is divine passion, whereby we suffer or endure something that is beyond us, more essential than we are. If the artist suffers, it is not because he wants to possess, but because he is possessed. Swan seems to grasp something akin to this in the third hearing of the Sonata at the saint Hubert Soiree, where our own evening began. Here, in spite of a great deal of sadness in his life, Swan finds in the Sonata an experience of the divine and finds that in the presence of those phrases from the Sonata, quote, death in their company would be less bitter, less inglorious, perhaps less probable, end quote. Here, Swan's thoughts turn for the first time to the composer Van Toy and to his work as artist. Swan regards, quote, musical motifs as actual ideas of another world, of another order, ideas, ideas veiled in shadows, unknown, impenetrable to the intelligence. And the composer is some explorer of the invisible who to, manages to capture one of these ideas, to bring it from that divine world to which he has access to shine for a few moments above ours. That was what Van Toy had done for the little phrase. Swan sensed that the composer had merely unveiled it, made it visible with his musical instruments, end quote. Swan compares the little phrase to scientific discoveries, the composer to other explorers of the unseen, like Lavoisier or Ampère. Haunted by the music, Swan is beginning to consider what it might be like to be a creator, a translator, a medium for that other realm. But at the end of, his of this performance, Swan's failure is captured completely when what he understands is that 
the feeling that Odette had had for him would never revive. His loss, however, is our gain. Swan has risen up the ladder only to fall back down. He's caught a glimpse of something, but he can't reach it. Life has gotten in the way of art. Interlude. I didn't warn you there would be an interlude. Sorry. For the reader, however, the elements of a theory are emerging, albeit a theory we will not get directly articulated to us, but must instead catch in glimpses and fragments and compound with our own experience. Let's briefly review these elements before we return back to our narrator. One, the artist has at least occasional glimpses into a realm of pure, of real existences. Two, that realm becomes accessible to the artist in a sudden, inexpressible rush of pleasure. The artist should beware here, lest he confuse this pleasure with sexual gratification. Three, the artist must then not create in the usual sense of the word, but unveil that universe or the essence she finds there by bringing its metaphor within the medium of her art and by delicately bringing her style to it. Four, the unveiling or the transformed appearance as it appears in artistic form entails a blurring of distinctions, a disruption of time and the intervention of memory, layering the same thing with differences and repetitions. Third part, the artist as narrator, as, sorry, the narrator as artist or as chicken. When we last discussed him, our young narrator had lost hope of ever becoming a writer. However, not long after we leave him, he does write something and he writes it precisely as the result of one of those encounters with fecund objects. Towards the end of Cambrai II, in what might be seen as its conclusion, our narrator finds himself compelled to set pen to paper upon watching distant steeples appear and reappear as he speared, speeds toward then away from them in a carriage. In an extraordinarily complex passage, we get two accounts of these steeples. First, from the perspective of the narrator, as the older author remembering this day in Combray when he was finally able to write something. We get the same steeples described again as a direct transcription of the piece of writing the boy produced in that moment. The boy, the very one in despair of his future as a writer and convinced that the things that bring him the greatest pleasure could not be the subject of a literary work, describes himself as finally yielding to his enthusiasm. He knows that there is something behind the sight of the steeples, something he recognizes must be, quote, analogous to a pretty sentence, end quote. When he finally grabs a pen and paper and puts words to his experience, he finds himself both happy and, quote, relieved of what the steeples had hidden behind them. As if I myself were a hen and had just laid an egg, I began to sing at the top of my voice, end quote. In order to probe his poultry-like relief and exultation, I will point to a few elements of the boy's experience here. We must first note something that is not mentioned in this passage at all, namely that we have already heard this narrator go on at length about church steeples, in, particularly, in particular, the steeple of the church in Cambrai. As a very young boy, the steeple at once represented to him the town of Cambrai. It behaved as a god, it appeared as a painting, or a beautifully baked brioche, and it had a character or a personality of its own. A steeple has dominated a part of his childhood, seen from every perspective in the town, summing up his summers there. Next, I will note that he is not actually able to compose anything when he is watching the steeples, though he experiences a profound sense that something lies hidden quivering below his sight of them. At first, he wants to put aside the hard work of pursuing the hidden. In fact, it's only from boredom and a long ride home that he begins to recall his steeples. In his memory of them, quote, 
their lines and their sunlit surfaces split apart, and a little of what was hidden from me inside them appeared to me." End quote. It is only in the recollection of the steeples that something essential emerges from them. Only then does it take on the form of sentences that can be written down. Thus, memory plays a twofold role here. The memories of his own childhood and steeples are one part. The memories of the very steeples he has just seen are another. In both, the steeples are not mere architecture, but are far more. In the beginning of the boy's piece of writing, he notes how the sun combines with the movement of the carriage to create the illusion of motion in the stationary steeples. At the end of his composition, against the almost set sun, the steeples watch the narrator depart. In both cases, the steeples are not mere objects, but actors, moving, then watching. It's not the first time that object fixity has been thrown into question. In the opening paragraphs of In Search of Lost Time, the narrator finds himself de- and then recomposed by the objects around him as he drifts in and out of sleep and memory. Here, the sun's playful casting of light and shadow confounds the senses and undermines the habitual ability to determine what is fixed and what moves, what is subject and what object. Like the half-awake narrator of the beginning, the artist loses the fixed boundaries of the self and merges into the fluidity of the objects around him. He might read about places or events, or he might be them. He might see steeples in the distance as he moves, or they might move and watch him. This fluid, liminal place is where the artist finds himself. Our older narrator will refer back to this moment, among others, and will describe these experiences as those that, quote, make death a matter of indifference to me, end quote. Yet the artist, in order to be an artist, must actually do something with the experience. Swan, on his first hearing of the sonata, gave up far too quickly the pursuit of what was beneath it. An older version of our narrator, tasting a madeleine dipped in tea that brings him an intense rush of pleasure, pursues the memory it suggests with intensity. The boy seems somewhat between the two. He's not quite sure why the experience demands that he write some sentences, but when he does put them down to paper, he feels, possibly for the first time in his life, that he has done his best to overcome the distance between realms. His writing occurred because he did not stop to probe the site, nor sit impotently waiting, awaiting an intellectual idea about them. In a break from his habitual laziness, he translated, he created, he allowed the experience to move through him from its realm into an analogy of words. This is what the artist must do. The artist must become the medium for what is in that other realm to be expressed, to find itself clothed in the analogical or creative form the artist provides. Yet, to the utter despair of his beloved grandmother, the narrator we follow chronologically through In Search of Lost Time writes almost nothing else within it. Our narrator seems at risk of merely living a life rather than creating one. And this is the final section, the self as subject of art. Let us briefly return to our piece of music. Far later in the novel, in volume five, the narrator hears the sonata, now a full septet, at yet another society party. He reflects that, and I'm quoting, the music seemed to me something more true than all known books. Sometimes I thought that the reason was that the things we feel in life are not experienced in the form of ideas. And so the translation into literature, an intellectual process, may give an account of them, explain them, analyze them, but cannot recreate them as music does, its sounds seeming to take on the inflections of our being, to reproduce that inner extreme point of sensation 
which is the thing that causes us the specific ecstasy we feel from time to time. Thus, nothing came closer than a fine phrase of Van Toy's to the particular pleasure which I had sometimes experienced in my life, before the spires of Martinville, for example, or certain trees on a road at Balbec, or more simply, as at the beginning of this work, when drinking a certain mouthful of tea. As the tea had done, the multiple sensations of light, the airy sounds, the noisy colors which Van Toy sent us from the world in which he composed, presented something to my imagination, forcefully, but too rapidly for it to take it in, something which I could compare to the perfume, perfumed silk of a geranium. The artist has access to a unique world, glimpsed in moments of extraordinary sensual pleasure. For the artist, pleasure is the response to something from that realm appearing or opening to her, transfigured, reformed, teasing, tempting, taunting, within her everyday experience. If she can stay focused, if she can pursue what lies behind the appearance, listening to its vibrations, attentive to its quivering, she may be able to share this realm with others, to become its conduit. She might find the right material for it and bring to it, quote, the necessary armature of a beautiful style, end quote. She cannot simply tell us what it is or merely show it to us, however. Because whatever it is, it is beyond or outside of time. It is not a moment, but a depth, a folding over of one experience, one time, into another. When we find it, when we experience it too, when we experience it, we too become outside of time. Thus, the work of the artist cannot simply mean showing this to us or saying it. The artist must get the audience to assimilate what she offers, to make it theirs, that is, to have such an experience themselves through her art. We are, of course, familiar here with talk of realms in which things appear fleetingly to one who pursues them. Does the artist have, some, have access to something like a platonic realm of forms? There are some similarities, certainly, but I think we are talking about something different from a platonic realm of forms here, for a few reasons. While whatever we find in this realm exists there without material form, I also think it yearns to be placed in material, to appear in the world, to offer us the particular joy of experiencing it. Our narrator suggests at times that it hides itself in objects that we may or may not encounter. And at other times, he says that the hidden truth is found partially in the object, partially in the subject. The body, the senses, are not an impediment to finding this realm, but are, in fact, our only access to it. Further, I do not think that what is found there is unchangeable. It seems to be different for different artists. And finally, whatever is there is not intellectual at all. Ideas will get in the way of our experience of it. The narrator calls reasoning a wandering off the path of pursuing the impression. This is why it is the artist and not the philosopher who can both access it and bring it to light. The work of the artist is not to find that realm and try to remain there, but to find the right metaphor, that which can carry something from that realm into our own. The artist who wants to produce something must stay with the pleasure long enough to see what is trying to communicate with him and then find the materials in which to bring it forth. The artist is medium. Like the varied ways in which motifs present themselves in a piece of music, what appears from that realm, rendered into material that is not quite its natural home, must show itself again and again in slightly altered forms until we begin to find the common essence underlying its material presentations. And what is it we find there? For the narrator, this essence consists of a relation to our past self, to the one that heard, saw, or experienced this thing before. The being that comes forth from that other realm is then the self. 
But it is not the self in the form of a memory or an idea of self. It is the very self of the past brought to the present. Or perhaps the present self is gone and the self of the past is again. In this, we become atemporal. The present becomes unreal and our real lives become insignificant compared to the past that is now present and the being we now are. In such an escape from time, as Swan had noted upon hearing the sonata, and our narrator discovers towards the end of the novel, quote, the word death has no meaning, end quote. For our sensitive and attuned narrator, the everyday offers these extra temporal experiences. For others of us, particular works of art might be our only access. We might have music that affects us like the Van Toy Sonata, paintings that undermine what seems real to us, poems that haunt us, books that take us outside of time. How does art produce this experience in its audience? We must first become open to what is other through a blurring of boundaries, through being thrust out of our habitual selves. Then, through memory, motion, repetition, analogy, plays of clarity and obscurity, we might find that what seemed to be sounding outside of us in the work of art now resonates within. To be moved by art is to find ourselves implicated in it, or to find it implicated in us, likely both. As our narrator notes, the content of art is not what is most fundamental to it. Art instead must create in us an experience, one similar to the pleasures of the steeples or the sonata. It must appeal to our senses and to a memory that is not intellectual but sensual and hence unaware of time. Art then can reveal, perhaps even recreate for its audience, the experience that the artist has in everyday life. The narrator struggled through most of the novel to understand that his own experiences, those of the sort we've been describing, could be the subject of art. He didn't find such accounts in the, or descriptions in the books that he was reading. Yet, through his own pursuit of art throughout the novel, and in particular, his pursuit of the fictional artists he encounters, Bergot, Van Toy, the painter Elstir, he discovers a form of art, a meaning of art, that eventually frees him to write something that, perhaps like Van Toy's music, shows us something we have never seen before. All of the work of the artist, writer, composer, painter, reveals what he says is, quote, a single beauty which each of them has brought to the world, refracted through different media, end quote. The book that he writes will reveal refracted across a single spanning work, the unique beauty that he has found behind the meaningful experiences of his life. For Proust, that essential thing he has discovered, the hidden, is the self, the self taken outside of or beyond time. How can he best bring us what he has found there artistic, how can he best bring what he has found there artistically to his reader? He must use the material of his art his own unique style, to display what hides beneath the appearance. How does he do this? From the beginning of the novel, Proust does not merely tell us about the eye that is his subject. First, he confuses us about the eye. The eye appears at different ages, different places, different times, and we can never quite locate him adequately. We never learn his name. We never know his age. Sleep, memory, leaps in and around time all combine both to display this eye to us while at once keeping him obscure to us. He is somewhere behind the motion of time, the confusion of images, the layers of memory we build up with him. In our confusion, we awaken to the possibility of assimilation. We are not merely told about the eye of the novel. We too must have the memories that emerge as the fundamental characteristics of this self through different ages, places, and times. Those experiences must become our own. And this is more than a sympathetic reading. 
we too must become the subject of the book we are reading. We must experience the rush of pleasure that comes from having the hidden thing, the past moment, appear again before us. The very essential, very real I being shown to us is not the one who is presented through the book. It is the one hidden under it, showing up in motifs, repetitions, motions, plays of light and shadow, and a past that is present again. It is the I of whom we can only ever have a series of impressions. This I, the I who exists outside of time as we know it and experience it, is something more divine, more essential, than the man who lived at a given time, loved specific people, and wrote a certain book, and more essential, too, than the first person narrator, the subject of that book. It is the one we catch in glimpses, in experiences of pleasure and joy as we read. If Proust produces art according to the narrator's artistic theory, then neither the life of the artist nor the life of the narrator reveals to us the real subject of the book. Instead, grasping what art is and what art does is to discover the essential subject and subjectivity of the novel. The book gives us access to what Proust discovered as the lining behind quotidian reality as Van Toy's music did for the narrator and for Swan. In this realm, we discover an I who merges the past and the present, an I for whom death loses its meaning. And if we too can escape from the past as we read, can escape from time as we read, we too might find the self of our past who haunts us from afar. In reading, we see inflections of ourselves. We remember ourselves. We find the repetitions and resonances in the thing that was distant, but is coming nearer the more we read and the more often we read. We must quiver with its vibration. We must allow the art to produce in us the experience of finding the same again. Then, the eye that we discover by reading In Search of Lost Time is not the author nor the narrator, but is, perhaps, the atemporal and essential being that is the reader this self, this I. Thank you.